So welcome everyone to the Threat of International Bureaucracy session. Uh, this session is sponsored by IGO Watch, which is a project of the Taxpayer Protection Alliance from the US. And this topic is, well, basically focused on the internet, the global international bureaucracies or IGOs as we call them. And you may have heard of the UN, the OECD, the World Health Organization, or even the European Union. And we as libertarians think that uh, these types of organizations frequent, frequently undermine democracy and accountability and that uh, these organizations and their conventions and regulations suggestions impact our domestic laws and our own regulation. And in the end, most of these organizations have some very hurtful policies and regulation and they impact our domestic laws and the way our laws are implemented and justified and basically just out of our need to fulfill our international obligations. So while many people know of the likes of the United Nations or the European Union, there are well, dozens of international government organizations that receive hundreds of millions, even billions of taxpayer funds, and they either generally use it to promote their radical agenda or to produce even more damaging policies or just flat out waste the funds. And up until now, there really hasn't been that much scrutiny of these organizations in any constant framework. There are only a few watchdog organizations that follow the work of a certain IGO, but most of them just focus on certain themes or certain issues that are pertaining to their own field of work. So with, that is the reason why uh, the TPA found, uh, founded IGO Watch to uh, point out the, these examples of egregious taxpayer fund wasting and to call for transparency, call for accountability, and to call these organizations out when they're betraying their uh, core missions. And uh, with, without much further ado, I would like to uh, give the floor to our speakers today with us. We have Dan Mitchell, who is a libertarian economist and co-founder of the Center for Freedom and Prosperity. Uh, we also have Ross Marchand, who is the Vice President of Policy at the Taxpayers Protection Alliance. And we have uh, Carlos Tagnaro, who is the Director of the Digital Economy Observatory at the Bruno Leone Institute. So without further ado, Dan, if you would like to take the floor. Well, th thank you. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about the Organization for Economic Cooperation <laughs> and Development, uh, but, I would just as much like to talk about the International Monetary Fund, the United Nations. There, this is a very target-rich environment because the fundamental challenge that we have with international bureaucracies is who is represented by these bureaucracies. It's governments. And what tends to happen with governments around the world? They, tend, they want to use these international bureaucracies to, uh, in effect, cartelize uh, public policy in the sense that governments, the politicians in government, they don't want competition. Uh, if we think about, say, grocery stores, supermarkets, uh, obviously any grocery store would like to be the only grocery store in a town because they could charge high prices. Uh, likewise, if we think about banks, uh, any bank in a town would like to be the only institution providing financial services so they could charge high prices. Well, the same thing happens with governments. Uh, globalization, which really began to take off about, what, 50, uh, 40 years ago, globalization was great news for consumers, but it was also great news for taxpayers because it meant there was more mobility in the world. You could, in effect, vote with your feet by escaping governments that were providing uh, poor quality services and charging very high prices, i.e. high taxes. And, and so that, I think, is the, the sort of fundamental structural way of looking at what is the problem with international bureaucracies? And, and, and I suppose I want to be fair. If you have an international bureaucracy that does something very benign, like coordinating air traffic control among countries, okay, that, that's good. We can all appreciate that. Now, does it actually require an international bureaucracy as opposed to simply some sort of working group among governments to come up with some original deal? Uh, that's, a, I suppose, a separate question. But I think in general, especially when we look at the big international bureaucracies, there's a major problem. And what I want to do is, uh, is uh, share uh, on the screen some uh, uh, a presentation 
about uh, what is wrong with the uh, OECD in particular. And I'm gonna walk through what I think are the, uh, the major challenges with the OECD's tax agenda. And first, for those of you who aren't familiar, the OECD is a Paris-based international bureaucracy. It basically represents the, uh, the rich countries of the industrialized world, although they throw in a few countries from the developing world, probably mostly for political correctness reasons. It gives them uh, the excuse to say that, oh, we represent the whole world, when in reality it's the rich man's club. Uh, most of the countries in the OECD are from Europe. When the OECD first started about six decades ago, it was actually relatively benign. It collected statistics that tried to create apples to apples numbers among different countries. Uh, that kind of thing was actually helpful for policy wonks who, who do studies. I'm sure it was a very expensive way of doing it, but it, for the most part, the OECD didn't do damage during its early decades. However, starting in the 1990s, uh, the OECD moved in the wrong direction. There's actually a very good academic study in the Columbia Journal of Tax Law describing how the OECD in effect evolved uh, into an organization that now exists in large part to try to help governments by stamping out uh, competition among governments uh, in order to have this cartelization of public policy. And I'm specifically gonna talk about the issue of tax competition. And why does this matter? Well, if you go back to say 1980 and you look at uh, over a 20 year, 25 year period, that was sort of the glory days of tax competition. Top individual income tax rates around the world were coming down, corporate tax rates around the world were coming down. Uh, we saw many countries uh, reducing or eliminating death taxes, wealth taxes, uh, lowering the double taxation of interest, dividends, and capital gains. Uh, you had a flat tax revolution uh, in many parts of the world. Uh, why were all these things happening? Uh, why did countries like fr even France and Germany lower tax rates when there's such a status political culture in these countries? It wasn't because they were reading my policy papers. I, I wish that was the case. It wasn't that they were reading Friedman and Hayek. Governments were being forced to lower tax rates for the simple reason that if they didn't, the geese with the golden eggs had much greater ability in this globalized era. They had the ability uh, to move either themselves or their money to jurisdictions with better tax policy. Now, if you're a politician, you hate this. Uh, you don't like the fact that you don't have the freedom to impose high tax rates anymore. Uh, you, you long for the days when you can impose top personal tax rates of 70% or more. You long for the days when corporate tax rates could be 50% and companies didn't have any choice but just, just to, to meekly accept it. Uh, so politicians clearly have a big reason to hate tax competition. Uh, and this is why they are using the OECD uh, as a vehicle. And probably the most important thing to understand is that what the OECD is trying to do in its effort to stamp out tax competition is fundamentally inconsistent uh, with the principles in the public finance literature for what is good for growth. Uh, good tax policy is low marginal tax rates, no tax bias against saving and investing, don't use the tax code to pick winners and losers, and the principle of territorial taxation only tax what's inside your national borders. Now, the OECD doesn't really get involved in the picking winners and losers, but all those other principles of tax policy, the OECD is unambiguously on the wrong side. And by the way, what makes this so amazing is that there's, a, there's an economic part of the OECD secretariat uh, where they write research papers, working papers, things like that. And many of the OECD's economists, when they write their academic studies, they actually point out that you, need, you should have all these principles of good tax policy. They even point out that jurisdictional competition is a good thing to keep governments from overtaxing and overspending. But unfortunately, those academic papers are never part of the OECD's policy agenda. That's driven by this Committee on Fiscal Affairs and the OECD Center on Tax Policy. And that's the politicized part that actually represents the interest of governments as opposed to the interest of the economy. 
And I wanna share a couple of images that I think make this clear. When we think as economists about why it's important to have low marginal tax rates, we think of someone choosing, should I work more? Should I be more productive? And if, as you see on this screen, if you have a 0% marginal tax rate, people are much more likely to say, yes, I wanna work more, earn more income, make myself better off. But as the tax rate goes up and up and up, as we head toward the bottom of the screen there, then all of a sudden people say, no, I don't wanna work as much. And what politicians want, of course, is to be at the bottom part of the screen with the high tax rates but as we saw in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, because of tax competition, they have lower tax rates. And this is marginal tax rates. Now let's think about it in the context of the double taxation of saving and investing, which is one of the worst features of tax systems. This chart here, which you probably won't be able to de decipher unless you look really closely, it shows that if you earn income, pay tax on the income, and then you have after-tax income, you basically have two choices either immediately spend the money or save and invest it so that you spend it in the future. Well, if you immediately consume your money, by and large, there's no tax penalty above and beyond whatever consumption taxes you have in your economy. But if you save and invest the money, which every economic theory, heck, even the Marxists and the socialists agree with this, every economic theory says saving and investing is good, but then you can have as many as four additional layers of taxes before eventually, you decide at some point in the future to consume the income where again, will be subject to whatever consumption taxes. Now think about this from a tax competition perspective. This is what politicians want. They want all the extra layers of tax because that's a great way of demonizing the rich. Oh, we're not gonna let these rich people save and invest and have capital gains and things like that. But in the 80s and 90s, when tax competition existed, they were improving tax policy in this regard. Now, what's happened, of course, unfortunately, is that politicians don't understand the basic economics. Think about it in this, in this rhetorical question I hear, have here. What's the best way to harvest apples? The best way is to pick them from the tree, not to chop down the tree. Well, all the double taxation that you have, capital gains taxes, death taxes, wealth taxes, double taxes on dividends, maybe it's not technically chopping down the tree, but it's sawing branches off the tree and that makes society poorer in the future because there's less capital formation, less saving and investing. Well, the bad news, we had this good era in the late 1900s of tax competition and globalization, forcing politicians to do the right thing. Unfortunately, in part because of the OECD, although to be honest, the OECD is simply the bureaucratic entity through which big governments like France, the US, Japan, uh, Germany, you know, they're the ones actually uh, making this happen because what they do is they pressure uh, low tax countries with sanctions and blacklists and things like that. But the, the sad news is that they are winning. Uh, the financial privacy, the human right of financial privacy has been eviscerated extraterritorial taxation has expanded. Uh, you know, we're seeing additional tax harmonization schemes that come not just from the OECD, but also from the European Commission. And, and I guess I'll just close, yeah, having given this sort of depressing story of how we had good policy during the era of tax competition, and now it's moving in the wrong direction. I'll close by simply sharing some quotes from Nobel Prize winners. I won't read this out because you can get the presentation from me if you want it. But you know, we, we have Buchanan, Friedman, I already showed uh, uh, others, uh, Vernon Smith, uh, Edward Prescott. I mean, they're, they're all making the same point. Uh, and if you understand public choice economics, of course, politicians are looking out for themselves. And that's why they have this tendency to overtax and overspend because that's their way of buying votes. Well, we need some countervailing force. And that's what these economists, uh, these Nobel Prize winners are talking about. Tax competition is a way of sort of countering the natural tendency of politicians to overtax uh, and overspend. And I'll simply close with the note that, of course, we don't like tax evasion because we believe in the rule of law. But the right way to get rid of tax evasion, to minimize it, to reduce it, is to have the kind of tax policy many of us have been talking about for decades low rate, no double taxation, territorial, without the loophole. And with that kind of system, the entire raison d'etre of the OECD 
doesn't exist anymore because it doesn't matter whether your bank account is in Geneva, Illinois, or Geneva, Switzerland, in Panama City, Panama, or Panama City, Florida. Now, I'll add one PS to this presentation. Trump has not done a lot to help on this issue. He hasn't gotten rid of our terrible extraterritorial FATCA law. He hasn't defunded the OECD. Uh, and by the way, I should point out, the bureaucrats of the OECD get tax-free salaries while they're jetting around the world trying to force countries to raise taxes. Uh, so, so Trump, by and large, hasn't been a big help on this. He hasn't been as bad as, say, Obama was, but he certainly hasn't moved the ball in the right direction. My email is on this uh, screen right here. So if anybody wants to uh, contact me and get the presentation, I'm happy to, to do that. Uh, and otherwise, uh, I'll go ahead and shut up there and uh, we can move on to the next presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. And now we go over to Ross. Ross, I know you had your hands full these last few months with the uh, everything that's been going on with the World Health Organization. And I know you've also written in previous years about their agency for research on cancer. So if you could enlighten us more on that topic. Absolutely. And the, um, the biggest sort of takeaway I got from Dan's presentation is towards the end. He was tying everything together. And he said, look, I'm sorry, this is a very uh, depressing presentation. Uh, but unfortunately, in terms of the soberness of the analysis, that is just the tip of the iceberg. Because when you're talking about the pandemic, coronavirus pandemic, we've all been going through, wandering through for the past three months or so, the World Health Organization, you would think by their name that they would be tasked with, you know, dealing with this in a straightforward way and coming up with a solution that could contain and perhaps, you know, expedite a cure for this deadly disease. But unfortunately, from day one, taxpayers across the world have been funding this organization to the tune of billions of dollars, right? And where has it gone? It has gone to an organization that apologizes um, for, for example, the communist Chinese government covering up the coronavirus and creating excuses. So our story begins in late December, 2019. And you had a handful of brave physicians in Wuhan. And they were saying, hey, look, there's a, there's a very mysterious, very sort of uh, suspicious virus that's spreading from patient to patient. It kind of looks like SARS. So this was reported uh, to the Chinese government. The physicians started speaking out. They started warning uh, their fellow citizens or warning other physicians about this SARS-like virus. The Chinese government promptly covered it up. They hauled the doctors to jail and they forced them to retract and sign confessions and say, listen, we're very sorry for disrupting the social fabric. Uh, we will never warn people about any deadly diseases ever again. So the Chinese government was, you know, communicating this to the WHO. The WHO, they were just kind of sitting on this information and they were saying, hey, look, guys, it's no big deal. Uh, they tweeted as late as January 14th, the Chinese authorities say that there's no evidence for human to human transmission of the coronavirus, took their word for it. Um, the director general of the World Health Organization praised China for their political commitment, their leadership, their transparency. All the while, you had this deadly disease that was just spiraling out of control, uh, spreading to places in Asia like Thailand, and then pretty much the rest is history. And you had a situation where you had um, Asian countries, and they were seeing this, right? And they were beginning to bear the brunt of this crisis. And they were warning the WHO, they were warning the Chinese authorities, basically anyone who would listen. And the WHO absolutely refused to give them time of day. And they said, hey, look, your concerns are not valid. And by the way, Taiwan, because we don't like you, because we're trying to, you know, settle scores on behalf of the Chinese government, we're not going to invite you to our emergency health meetings. I mean, this is, this is the opposite of what we would expect from an organization that is tasked with uh, defending and spearheading public health initiatives. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. I mean, taxpayers across the globe are funding an organization that puts out inaccurate data about the spread of the coronavirus. So much so that Oxford-based Our World in Data, which is basically um, a, a data repository, right? And, and a, a global think tank. They said, hey, look, we can no longer rely on and use 
uh, the World Health Organization's data. It's simply too inaccurate. We're going to have to use um, European data instead, data from the European Centers for Disease and Control. So my question is, you know, why are we continuing to fund an organization, right, taxpayers from the world over, if they can't even be trusted to impartially provide information and hold governments accountable for inactions and cover-ups related to the coronavirus pandemic? But wait, hold on, it gets worse. And these problems absolutely precede the pandemic um, by over 50 years, because you have a sub-agency of the World Health Organization um, known as IARC, and I always butcher this, um, the Institute for, the Agency for the Institute of Cancer Research. And for over 50 years, they've been basically the gatekeepers of study and statistical analysis as to um, what substances are harmful, what things are good, and what things are bad, right? And again, this is supposed to be under the veneer of public health, advancing public health around the world, taking our taxpayer dollars, so we absolutely have the right to hold them to a high standard. But you look at this sort of analysis that IARC is putting forward, and basically, everything causes cancer to these guys. I mean, you look at coffee. I don't know about you guys, I drink I don't know, four or five cups of coffee a day, and according to pretty much every scientific analysis under the sun, coffee has important protective effects against a variety of cancers and diseases, but not so according to IARC. IARC said for years and years, for decades and decades, hey, coffee is likely to be carcinogenic. And then they backtracked, but they refused to acknowledge the scientific evidence saying, hey, this actually may have protective effects against cancer. And now the very best they could come up with is saying, Ah, we're not sure. We're just going to throw our hands up into the air. It's not classifiable as the, the carcinogeneity um, of this substance. But what you see here right, is a common thread across the World Health Organization, um, across other international governmental organizations uh, like the European Union, is a risk aversion, a politicization of science, and an over-reliance on the precautionary principle where we're not going to rely on statistical real world analysis in grounding our conclusions. Instead, we're going to jump to the worst case scenario and we're going to make excuses for our own inept policy making. And we're going to say basically everything is harmful, even if there are important protective effects or you know, in the case of the pandemic, even if a substance could be helpful um, in, for example, building medical devices that are key to treating coronavirus patients, uh, we don't care because if there's even a small minute possibility that this substance could be harmful, we're just not going to permit it. Um, and you've seen this in the case of the European Union. I mean, not just IR. I mean, moving over to the European Union, um, you see the way that they have classified silicones. They've called them substances of highest concern. And they said, look, basically, you cannot use these substances um, across the Eurozone, even though they play a pivotal role in and a host of applications ranging from airbags to bandages to all sorts of medical devices. And what's really, I think what's really uh, disconcerting here is that different international governmental organizations, they piggyback off of each other and they magnify the damage produced um, by the first IGO that created the damage to begin with. So in the case of silicones, you have the European Union saying this is a no-go, um, these substances are very scary, despite real-world empirical evidence to the contrary. And now the United Nations is considering, through the Stockholm Convention, uh, banning the substance worldwide, which, by the way, you would think the United Nations maybe doesn't have a lot of power in enforcing their mandates, but you would be wrong, because a lot of jurisdictions around the world, um, including the People's Republic of California, um, they treat things like United Nations judgments and IARC judgments as legally binding. So you have to be very careful, right? And we have to ask the question, if we are funding these organizations to the tune of billions of dollars per year, are we holding them accountable? What are they doing with our taxpayer dollars? What sort of scientific analysis are they offering us? And what are the real world consequences of the bans that they are proposing and they have the legal power to implement in a lot of jurisdictions around the world. So I say, I mean, look, at uh, IGO Watch, at the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, we've had our hands full, especially over the past couple of months, and holding these organizations accountable. But we need all your help. What's that thing that you hear in the DC Metro all the time? Um, if, you, 
if you see something, say something. This applies around the world to actions by the World Health Organization, their sub-agency IR, European Union, all these organizations. Help me, help us hold them accountable and make sure we know where our hard-earned taxpayer dollars are going. Uh, so that's all I have for now. Thanks. Thank you, Ross. And now heading over to our European Union representative in this call. And Carlo, can you tell us something more about the European Union's persistence to implement the EUI digital tax? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let me share my, my presentation. Should be this one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to tell you actually a, 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 a nice story because to some, up to some extent, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about the taxation of digital products in the European Union. And as I will show you until now, uh, the European Union has actually resisted pressures from the member states uh, to introduce new digital taxations. But like in any other, uh, in any libertarian fairy tale, there is no happy ending. So every, everything can, can, go, can go badly in the, in the, in the near future. But let me uh, first of all introduce the issue if, if I can switch slides. Okay. Uh, uh, basically, I, I'm not developing a sort of libertarian argument, strictly speaking. I'm just trying to uh, set up what the mainstream theory of taxation says uh, in, uh, 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 about digital as well as non digital products. Now, the modern theory of taxation says profits should be taxed uh, where production takes place or where value is created. This is why uh, if you have a factory, uh, the taxes on profits uh, from, from selling the products which are uh, manufactured in that factory are paid in that country and not in other places where they may be sold and where, there, and where consumption happens. Uh, of course, uh, when it comes to digital products, it may not be as easy to tell where production happens and where uh, value is created. Uh, if you're talking about cars, it is clear uh, that, that cars are produced where the factory is. If you are talking about, let's say, the, the intermediation services of Amazon or, or the entertainment uh, uh, services of Facebook, uh, then it becomes uh, kind of harder uh, to tell where uh, production happens, where value is created, and therefore uh, where profits uh, should be subject to taxation. But not easy does not necessarily mean that it is impossible, even under the, the, the current uh, uh, tax systems, which I'm going to, to, to show in a moment. Despite this, there is a growing uh, uh, request in the European Union and, and I think elsewhere as well uh, to introduce a special taxation on, on digital products on well actually on digital companies uh, like Amazon, Facebook, Google and the likes. And, and, and the question that one uh, uh, asks is whether all of these proposals are actually about taxation that is uh, are we talking about how to make our tax system more fair, or is it about competition? In other words, are we talking about uh, how to uh, uh, impose the fair amount of taxes on Amazon, or the actual end game uh, is about uh, protecting the competitors of Amazon and of Google, of Facebook and Twitter and, and whoever, of Zoom, and whoever from, from the most efficient companies on the market. Um, as I said, until now, uh, the European Union has been uh, pretty much uh, a success story in, in, in this field. And the reason is that uh, uh, we have uh, at the core of the European Union uh, a very, I, I think one of the best features of the European Union is the discipline of state aid. Under the discipline of state aid, no uh, discretionary spending is allowed in member state uh, that favors specific firms within an industry. And the reason why state aid is not allowed is that, of course, if any national government could subsidize this and that, or 
uh, reduce taxation on this and that, or impose higher taxation on, on, on this and that, uh, then the uh, broader goal of building a single market within the European Union uh, would be undermined. And so far, uh, the state aid discipline uh, has been uh, instrumental in preventing the proliferation of local taxes on digital products because the reason what the, the, the main argument was that by taxing digital products that are uh, alternative to uh, uh, traditional products, uh, member state might actually distort competition. Uh, the problem is that now state aid discipline uh, is subject to an increasing amount of criticism uh, from member states and as a part of the uh, coronavirus recovery package, it is also temporarily suspended. Um, how did it work? Uh, how did uh, uh, the state aid discipline work in, uh, with regard to uh, digital taxation? And, and how uh, could uh, member states and the European Union uh, deal with uh, digital companies uh, within the framework of the tradition, what I call the traditional taxation theory? Well, we have several cases. Uh, for example, a case of the European Union against Ireland on alleged state aid to Apple. I'm not entering into, uh, 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 into the, the technicalities of the case, uh, and I'm not even taking a position on that. Uh, we have had uh, several attempts, and, and actually, in some cases, successful attempts uh, of member states, including my own Italy, uh, to uh, 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 pursue uh, digital companies uh, uh, to recover uh, tax revenues. And we have had many, many other cases uh, such as this one. What, what do these cases show? They show, first of all, uh, that within the traditional framework of taxation, uh, e the EU and member states do have the instruments to ask uh, digital companies to pay the, their fair share, whatever the fair share is, without introducing a specific uh, digital tax or, or any other uh, uh, form of di discriminatory uh, taxation. Uh, despite that, uh, in the last few years, uh, the, uh, the pressure uh, to increase taxation on, on digital companies uh, has, has grown, and we have at least two examples and maybe three. Uh, example number one is Italy, example number two is France, and both of these countries passed what they call a web tax. Basically, it is a tax on, on the revenues uh, by large online platforms. Uh, in both cases, uh, it is around 3% of their revenue. Now, what is the peculiarity of this tax? Uh, it is that uh, the taxable income uh, is not really an income, it is revenues. And the theoretical rationale of this tax is that digital companies are tax evaders. And, and so, because since there is no way to make a, 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 a fair assessment of where value is created, and there is therefore no way to tell what their real income is, then we are, as a second best, we have to tax revenues. Of course, this does not hold uh, uh, any kind of scrutiny or any kind of objection. First of all, because as I said, uh, uh, there are precedents where, where uh, the European tax authorities could go after uh, digital companies. And secondly, uh, because uh, again, revenues are, can, are not and cannot be uh, logically a, a, a taxable uh, income, which is why we, we talk about taxable income, by the way. Uh, what are the problems with these two national taxes that Italy and, and France passed? First of all, they are inconsistent with the digital single market. Under the digital single market and under the uh, state aid discipline, uh, the same, uh, uh, there is freedom of circulation of goods and services within the European Union. And therefore, uh, a taxation that, that uh, sort of uh, distorts uh, the choices of consumers by favoring this or, or, or disincentivizing that, uh, is in principle contradictory with the digital single market. Uh, secondly, it relies on a presumption that the place of production is the same place as the place of consumption, which is generally not true, and it is very unlikely true in the case of digital taxation. Uh, 
Point number three, it works as a sort of 3% additional VAT on digital transactions, being it levered uh, as a, a, a tax on revenues, uh, which is a tax on, 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 uh, uh, on the uh, uh, sales of digital companies, it is very likely to be almost fully or, or fully um, translated uh, onto, onto uh, final consumers. And so uh, it, it is very likely to disincentivize this digitalization and, and innovation within the European uh, Union. Uh, there were also proposals for a similar tax at the European level that until now uh, were uh, rejected. Part of the reason why they were rejected was that uh, there is this ongoing uh, negotiation at the OECD in order to define uh, digital uh, uh, taxable incomes. And so European Union has been waiting and waiting and waiting uh, in order to understand whether some sort of international agreement could, could be found on this. But now things may change because the European Union is going to uh, deliver a very large uh, expenditure package uh, as a part of its uh, general, more general recovery plan after the coronavirus. And uh, there are increasing rumors that a sort of digital tax, like the national ones I, I mentioned from Italy and France, but imposed at the uh, EU level, uh, might provide the, the main for, for this new uh, new uh, uh, major uh, public spending package. So what is the, the uh, conclusion uh, I come to? Um, first of all, digitalization uh, uh, changes everything and, and to some extent it also changes the way uh, products are priced and, and incomes are, are evaluated and incomes are taxed. Uh, this may create a window of opportunity for, for digital companies to engage in opportunistic behaviors and maybe even in, in tax evasion. But uh, most member states and certainly the most, most I mean, uh, states in the world and certainly the member states in the Europe of the European Union do actually have the, the instruments even within the existing uh, uh, tax systems to go after uh, uh, digital companies as well as non-digital companies. Uh, of course, the problem indeed is that we, 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 uh, we have too much taxation, not too little, but this is a different, uh, this is a different issue, of course. Um, until now, the, the uh, push towards uh, a, the taxation of digital products has been resisted uh, for reasons that have little to do with taxation, but in a way, uh, the request for digital taxes has also little to do with taxation. Of course, money is always something good for, for national governments, but I think the main reason behind, as I said, the main reasons uh, behind uh, the request for digital taxation has to do with competition between digital and non-digital companies. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, this is in a way a, a very nice success story uh, of the European Union and to some extent it is also something that should, should challenge us as libertarians vis-a-vis -vis our, our view of, of this kind of international organizations. Uh, in, in this specific case, I, I think the EU has been helpful in, in preventing a, 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 what I think would be a, a wrong choice in the design of tax systems. Uh, but uh, being uh, uh, the world, the real world, a very bad place for libertarians, even this uh, uh, success story may soon come to, to, to an end. Thank you very much. And let me stop my uh, share screen of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlo. And we have some questions from our audience. So the first question, and I think that's mainly pointed to Ross, is it a good idea that the US will withdraw from the World Health Organization and why? Yeah, I think it is. And this has been the, uh, the most important bit of news, uh, the most important bit of World Health Organization related news to happen in some uh, time. And just last week, President Trump, the Trump administration signaled to the UN, signaled to Congress that, hey, we're going to start this formal process of withdrawal from the World Health Organization. But whenever you're evaluating a policy like this, you have to ask yourself, what are you trying to accomplish? Now, 
the concept, the theory behind the World Health Organization is not necessarily a terrible one. It could make sense to have a global clearinghouse and coordination mechanism for protecting and advancing public health priorities. It's just being done in a terrible way. And the current bureaucracy that exists, it's way too entrenched, it's way too sprawling, and it's far too unaccountable. So the idea is that if you withhold funding and you withdraw your membership for a few years, maybe that could be a mechanism. Maybe that could be um, a push for reform at the World Health Organization. And that is not just a theory. And that is not just you know, optimistic sort of armchair theorizing. This happened under the Carter administration. Um, President Carter withdrew from the International Labor Organization, and it was a very similar sort of situation as to what is going on right now with the World Health Organization. Back then, this was back in the days of worldwide communism and the Soviet Union, and the International Labor Organization was not holding uh, the Soviet Union and uh, communist member nations accountable for egregious labor violations and really just exploiting and abusing workers. Um, so Carter said, just like what Trump is saying with the World Health Organization, um, this unaccountable global bureaucracy is leading to the politicization of the priorities that they're supposed to be um, preserving and protecting. Um, and it just didn't pan out that way. So Carter withdrew and the ILO panicked and it basically forced them to clean up shop and to hold communist member states accountable for these labor violations. So it worked then and it could work now in holding the World Health Organization accountable. So yes, long story short, it is a good idea to withdraw from the World Health Organization. I'm just gonna butt in there. Sorry, hi, I'm Eloise from Sydney's office. Um, just letting you know you got 10 minutes left of um, yeah, sure. Thank you. We just have a few more questions. And on a similar note, I would like to ask a similar question to Dan. So would it be a good idea for the US to completely withdraw from the OECD? Or is it maybe too naive to think that maybe that the US could work on basically restructuring the organization's tax harmonization principles and approach? In theory, you could have uh, some of the more market-oriented countries in the OECD have a very conscious campaign uh, to try to reform the organization. And that actually does happen. Uh, th there are some people that the Trump administration has put in who are trying to uh, steer the OECD in the right direction. Uh, but I think in the long run, those efforts simply won't succeed. Uh, Part of my answer has to deal with just the technical way the OECD operates. When it gets involved in policy, it does it through committees. And I think I mentioned the Committee on Fiscal Affairs uh, in my presentation. Well, the Committee on Fiscal Affairs is the policy arm for tax policy at the OECD. And who are the representatives from national governments who serve on this Committee on Fiscal Affairs? They're representatives of the tax police of those member countries. So what are the odds that you will ever get sensible tax policy from the OECD when the people who sit down in a room with no accountability, uh, no oversight, when, when they basically represent the tax police? It would sort of be like uh, you know, the Chamber of Commerce in every town being nothing but the insurance companies. Well, okay. It's good to have insurance companies having a voice in the business world, but should the entire business world be structured according to insurance companies? Or should, should universities be governed solely by their history departments? Uh, so you have these people with a tax enforcement mindset, tax uber alles, they have tunnel vision, they get together and they basically are told, what's your fantasy for the way the world looks? And so they don't consider uh, any sort of issues. I mean, in my presentation, I referenced uh, this OECD multilateral convention, uh, because why? Tax authorities, the tax police, they like getting more information because, oh, we can enforce our tax systems better. But under this multilateral convention, the expectation is that countries that join up will promiscuously and without restriction share information with some of the worst, most corrupt, most totalitarian countries around the world. I mean, you have countries like, like Russia and China, uh, not to mention third world kleptocracies that are highly corrupt 
And when you're sharing information with governments like that, the potential for problems dealing with everything from kidnapping to crime to corruption to political persecution to ethnic persecution, I mean, to me, this Committee on Fiscal Affairs structure is guaranteed to fail. And so at the end of the day, even though, yes, in theory, you could reform the OECD so it goes back to being a benign collector of statistics, I just don't think in the long run that's going to work. It, it, it would just take so much effort and it would rely on having some market-oriented uh, countries with the right people in power for an extensive period of time. I think it's far better that I mean, the U.S. is the biggest subsidizer of the OECD. Uh, it's American taxpayers giving these bureaucrats their very lavish, generous tax-free salaries. I'd much rather just cut them off. Uh, the OECD is trying to create sort of the equivalent of OPEC for politicians. Uh, well, you can't have OPEC without Saudi Arabia. I don't think you can have a global tax cartel without the United States. So I think the United States should simply, should simply pull out and let the OECD bureaucrats figure out someone else to subsidize their tax-free salaries. Thank you, Dan. And also a similar question for Carlo about the future of EU. There have been talks for these past years about uh, many different countries following the Brexit example and leaving Italy, of course, as well. And so what do you think the future holds for the EU withdrawals or unity? Well, no, I, I don't expect many countries to follow uh, Britain in, in Brexit, partly because uh, the, the, the Brexit uh, dynamics show that leaving the EU is very costly under several dimensions. I mean, w w one thing is asking whether it was right or wrong to join the European Union, but once you are in, getting out is hard and costly. And, and at least for some countries, uh, I think even from a libertarian point of view, uh, it would not be a good option, including Italy. Uh, that said, uh, I'm pretty much concerned uh, about the consequences of the coronavirus on what the European Union is. I mean, the EU uh, in the past uh, uh, 20 years uh, has been, uh, on one hand, promoting uh, harmonization, both in fiscal and, and regulatory environments, which is not always good. I, I mean, in most cases, it's probably not good in some cases. It, it, it may have been useful, uh, but on the other hand, it has also been promoting market integration and liberalization and, and to some extent even deregulation, even though I, I understand that talking about deregulation and European Union in the same uh, sentence may, may uh, appear very strange. Uh, what, what is most important, uh, the European Union and particularly the Euro uh, were very, very uh, successful, well, not very successful, but were relatively successful in imposing member states more fiscal discipline than they would have had uh, without it. Now, after the coronavirus crisis, uh, uh, my fear is that we are definitely on a, a high debt, high spending uh, uh, road, and with the EU becoming uh, or, or being directly responsible for a large chunk of, of spending and eventually even taxation. Uh, this uh, web tax debate, as well as the debate on uh, uh, carbon taxes, uh, may become a, a turning point because it may, uh, it may be the first cases where we have European taxes, which are directly uh, leverage it upon European citizens and businesses rather than having national taxes uh, with a share of them which is uh, repaid to the to fund the EU budget in, in a second time so I'm I'm uh, I, until now I, I would have been among the least Euroskeptic or the more the most uh, Euro enthusiast in the libertarian circles I'm, I'm uh, uh, becoming increasingly uh, scared about what the European Union may become in the next few years. Uh, but the good news is that there is absolutely nothing we can do about it. So <laughs> just, I don't care. All right, sorry to just jump in here really quick. We will be having to move on to the next breakout session, but uh, you don't have to leave necessarily. Marco, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make you the host 
meaning that we'll sign off basically this segment of the Three Dream Conference. We'll be over, we'll move on to the next breakout, but anyone who wants to give some last thoughts, uh, if you wanna go ahead and unmute people so there can be a little bit of a back and forth, you're free to do that. Uh, but let me just thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, I know it was a really interesting and insightful conversation.